Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 662. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 11th, 2021. First question, where's Kevin? Last time I was on the air with you guys, I reported that I was having trouble finding a $60 part to get the RV back on the road, and we were kind of stranded in the middle of Allentown, Pennsylvania. I uploaded that episode, and seconds after I hit the upload button, I get a knock on the door. They had found the part. 20 minutes later, I was on the road. So that whole uh, first world COVID problems, woe is Kevin, I can't get anywhere problem was resolved through prayer and a, a tedious parts supply person who finally found the part. And so we made it up to New York. We attended my nephew's wedding here, uh, had a great time. We're going to mosey on over to Connecticut next. Uh, Monstro is back on the road and that little $60 seal I needed for the uh, differential worked just fine. Um, George, you've been a bachelor now for a couple days. What are you up to? Well, I am uh, filming from my house this morning. Uh, to Tuesday is supposed to be my day off, but I don't really think I have days off. I have gap batches off. Yes. Well, last night after I was done talking to Susan on the phone, she's up in Philadelphia, I couldn't go to sleep. So I began to reorganize my library. Now, let me just give people some background. Kevin, you've seen my house. Mm -hmm. And I am the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son, going back a long time. Susan is the youngest daughter, the youngest daughter, the youngest daughter, the youngest daughter, going back, way back. Now, what does that mean? Do we get any money? No. But when people die, you get great grandmother's furniture. <laughs> or you get their books and because nobody else in the family wants these things and I'm the oldest so I have to do all the work and she's the youngest so she's given all the stuff so I have like my grandmother's my grandfather's book collections and I've been organizing them and it's fascinating because you sort of get an insight into their minds and that uh, my I have I found a first edition of Ethan Frome uh, from 1911 really? uh, that with little schoolgirls writing and you know great grandmother of Susan's and my grandmother all these not all these uh, John Steinbeck and William Soroyan and all yeah. the sort of things that were popular among the urban bourgeois in the night in 1940s it's just fascinating but but being George I'm arranging them according to color that's not Dewey. Dewey's no, different. It's, it, it's the Conger decimal system. Blue, green. I'm, I'd like to sort of, uh, you know, we do have a fuchsia section, but, uh, uh, and yes, Kevin, even though my wife is away, I am still taking my pills. That's so, I hope uh, so, yes. I would love to walk in to the New York Public Library and say, where is the red section? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we re recently converted to the Conger Decimal System. That's funny. Uh, all right, so we have uh, a good four stories to talk about. One of them is not Anglican. And when we talk about the story, you'll say, thank God it's not Anglican, because the Anglican communion is screwed up enough. We don't need this. Well, this is coming. When I say it's a Lutheran story, the Episcopal Church is going to pick up on this, and they're going to want one. And Soon after that, the Church of England is going to want one, and everybody's going to want one, except GAFCON probably won't want one. ACNA won't want one. But the Lutheran Church has its first trans bishop, a person who used to be... Does she used to be a Volkswagen who changes into a uh, robot? No. So what sort of trans are you Well, they, I mean, and we, here's the serious part of this, this story. This is gender dysphoria, uh, dysphoria. We've talked about it many times uh, in reporting issues. Gender dysphoria is a psychological um, illness, a mental illness. It, it deals with people who have anorexia. It deals with people who have uh, gender identity issues. You have a male content for your body and how your body feels. And a person with gender dysphoria generally really has this feeling. The feeling is real. But as we know, and we've talked about in psychology before, feelings are not facts. And we do not generally allow people to live their delusions. And 
this I is take that, that. That's the serious part of the story. Now we can be a little bit more jovial, George. <laughs> well, I, I come out of this from being the father of a uh, young woman who suffered from anorexia for mm -hmm. several years. As a, in her late teens, early 20s, my daughter was convinced she was grossly obese. Convinced. And when she was in college, it got so bad that we had to take her out of school and she was hospitalized for several months because she almost died. But when she looked in a mirror, she, Laura is five foot seven, five foot eight, and she weighed like 98 pounds. Um, she looked like she got out of Auschwitz. Uh, in fact, she was so thin, she stopped having her menstrual cycles and everything. I mean, she, her body was starving itself. But what she saw was not the reality. She saw balloon girl. And, you know, thanks be to God with uh, treatment and uh, everything. She is, you're, she's never going to be over it. I mean, she's going to have to work for the rest of her life to deal with issues psychologically from body image. But not being a psychologist, just paying ungodly amounts of money to psychologists uh, and having a mother as a psychologist, I, I am of the persuasion that gender dysphoria is akin to, uh, well, certainly the same part of the brain, certainly the same pathologies. Well, so here we have here we have a poor, let, let's talk about this girl. Uh, sure. Her name is Megan Rohrer. Or uh, it's, a, it's now Bishop Megan uh, Rohrer. Uh, she's from South Dakota. She's in her early 40s. She's pretty young to be a bishop, by the way. Um, but that's the Lutherans. She grew up in South Dakota. And I. this is not in the press release from the Lutheran uh, Diocese of uh, Northern uh, California, which covers San Francisco north and mm -hmm. bits of over to Lake Tahoe. She uh, said that when she was a teenager in uh, South Dakota, she came out as a lesbian. Well, the I think it was a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, didn't really take that on board. And she felt she was ostracized by her church, her family, her friends for being lesbian. She went off to college and in the university, the culture there affirmed her in her sexuality. Life goes on and she began to feel that, you know, she really, she liked women, but she really thought maybe she was a man deep inside. And she began the transformation outwardly to, it's, and that, and I don't like talking about this because I'm not, I'm a squeamish person, but when you, when you I can say that she had a happen, mastectomy. Yes. Yeah. And then she had her plumbing reworked below. And at that point, she was then presented herself for ordination. She was living in San Francisco. And the Lutherans there ordained her. And there was a problem raised at one point by the last Lutheran conservative saying, well, our official policy at this time is that we don't ordain non-celibate gays and lesbians. Oh, well, she's had a sex change operation, so she's not really, so she wouldn't count anymore. Yeah, that, that's more. That's that's an argument. That's fine. No, uh, I mean, whether I whether I agree with it, it's an argument. For the Lutherans, I'll let that slide. You, you got it. <laughs> and then, uh, so her career goes on, and she's now uh, was elected this past week bishop mm -hmm. uh, for that synod in Northern uh, California. Well, before we move to the Nicaea part of the, the story, we need to establish here that you know these feelings are real. When mm -hmm. an anorexic people person feels that they're fat, that feeling is real. When a person with gender dysphoria feels that they're the wrong gender, that is a real feeling. When you know, and so we want to honor and recognize that the, the feelings are real, but the feelings are not facts. And it's incumbent upon society not to let people live into their delusions, because it's mm -hmm. not, not just bad for them; it's it's bad for society. It's bad for the church. Um, and, and we need, that's where we stop and say stop. And it's also, it's also bad for those who care for this person. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is that when you are so devoutly convinced that you're fat, and if you have people who love you who say, no, Bonnie, no, dear, you're not, the response is anger, vitriolic anger, the same degree of anger, I'm assuming now because I don't know this, that someone that this girl may have had for people who loved her, her parents or whatnot, who said, no, you're not. A girl, a boy, you're a girl. And part of the key is that you just have to hold on while they pass through this. Hopefully they'll get out to the other side 
we're very lucky. Uh, you remember the pop singer Karen Carpenter? Mm. Uh, she thought she was anorexic and she eventually died of heart failure in her early 30s because of what the starving herself did to her body. So, I mean, anorexia is a killer. Uh, bulimia is a killer because of the physical consequences. Well, uh, and so is gender dysphoria. The suicide rate among gender dif people who suffer with gender dysphoria is the highest in the industry. It's higher yeah, than uh, LGBT, no, not the T, the, the uh, bisexual people. And part of the thing is, oh, well, it's because society is so mean to them. No, it's not. It's, it's, you're looking at, you're basically looking at the conclusion and thinking that's what drives things. No, um, it is a mental disorder that some people, well, as I say, I pray for this woman uh, and she may hate me for saying that she's a woman. And I may find it silly that she calls herself they as the personal pronoun. It's not a he or not a she, it's a they. Mm -hmm. And I, some wag wrote uh, that, uh, isn't that uh, funny? Because that's what the demon said to Jesus uh, when he was casting them out of the men possessed by demons into the Gadarene swine. What have you to do with us, Jesus? Us. Mm, us, yeah. So they, uh, I pray for this person because she's put herself so through very much and the people around her. And she is basically, it, will she be one of these people who encourages the mutilation of children? Or will she say, look, here's been my experience. You need to make an adult decision. At the end of the day, she has to live her life. I couldn't live it for her and I shouldn't live it for her. But I think for me, the issue is we read these horror stories, horror stories of, and there was a shampoo commercial where these two women were, you know, brushing this little boy's hair and the little boy was saying he really wanted to be a girl. And, I forget which shampoo company it was, but it was just child abuse, yeah. child abuse, where the adults are convincing the child that they're in the wrong body. Where will she be on issues like this? Yeah, well, I, the horror story she tells is Nicaea. So um, she wants to go all the way back to the third century of the church and say that's where things started to go wrong. Mm-hmm. What say you, George? Well, when I read this, I was thinking, what? I don't, because her point was that the Council of Nicaea was called to deal with the problems of trans transgender Christianity. And that was one of the big issues there. Now, I didn't get that from Professor Rowan Greer at Yale Divinity School 30 years ago. I just missed that class. I must have slept late. Well, looking into this, where's she coming from? Well, one of the things the church was debating at the time is what to do with eunuchs yes. who had become Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, eunuchs are men who have been castrated, or as the Old Testament says, had their stones crushed. Uh, sometimes they were captured to slaves as little boys, and before they hit puberty, they were, they were castrated to serve in harems or as, as personal servants. Sometimes they bought their freedom, sometimes they escape, but whatever. What do we do with these people who have now become Christian? Because the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy is quite clear that they're not allowed in the temple. Correct. And we just had the reading about the Ethiopian eunuch, so here's gospel <laughs> preaching. But, but, and so the church decided if you were castrated against your choosing, then you will be received fully into the church. If you chose to be castrated in order to have financial gain or a career gain that you're a poor poor boy from the country and that the way to get ahead is to be castrated and get a job at the palace then you can be a catechumen but you're never going to become a full member of the church and i believe it's from this choice of those who choose to be unmanned which is the old greek way of describing it uh in castration if you choose to be unmanned, you cannot be in within the the circle. And this new bishop elect is saying that that's you know she's going to work to overturn Nicaea on these grounds. Well, well I good mean, luck to you. Yeah, good luck with you. Well, I mean, one of the things we see now is you know the the number two surgery is detransition surgery. People who regret their transition who were told that uh, transitioning from one 
uh, gender to the next bio in the best biological surgery we can do will make you feel better about your body. They go from a man to a woman and then they all of a sudden discover, wait, I still have uh, image issues. What do I do now? Uh, this, didn't, a, this didn't solve my image issue. And it's now reached the point that uh, I think it was a federal judge, Texas of all places, mm -hmm. who uh, somebody sued to have uh, their child's ch sex change covered by their health insurance through their employer. And the, and the health insurance company turned it down. I don't know whether it was Blue Cross or Cigna, who, whoever it was. But the, uh, the, the judge ruled that under the uh, uh, US law as it stands right now, you cannot turn down if uh, sex insurance companies cannot refuse to permit, refuse to pay for gender reassignment surgery, they call it, because of the, of, uh, the it's just so silly. It, well, I mean, in Christian terms, this is a bad news week. In secular terms, it's a bad news week. Right now, uh, Hamas is pounding Israel with rockets. Gets up to 450 in the last uh, a couple hours. You know, it, it's a hard day to sit down and record a show on news, especially about something that's just going to devastate the witness of the Lutheran Church. Um, that, are that, the Lutherans are poorly. pounding Israel with rockets too? Or? Yeah, no. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's self. <laughs> the Lutherans are committing suicide. Is what they've done here. Um, let's move on to some more local news. Uh, Justin Wolkbley has. Uh, offered to help people who are offended by statues. And I thought that was a, a great story we could follow up with. Um, one of the yeah, they used to have that statue of Rocky Balboa in front yeah. of the Philadelphia Art Museum. I, I saw it. I was offended by that. You were I mean, offended. Just, well, I, they moved it down to the, uh, to the, I think it moved to the Spectrum or to the football stadium, but it just, you know, because it's right next to the Rodin exhibit, Rodin, not Rodin, the giant monster from no. Godzilla movies, no. but the, you know, the French sculptor. Uh, no. well, what I digress. I, I digress. Yeah, that's fine. It's fine. One of the we bigger did, issues We mentioned is, Sylvester Stallone in each episode at one, at least once. That's the should. rule. In fact, I just ran the steps two weeks ago. I, we were in Philly, and Jill and her twin sister said, let's run the steps. No, let's not. And so we, <laughs> we took our picture with Rocky. We ran the steps. I got up there. I wasn't breathing heavily, and I my my chest was not pounding. So I'm like, oh, I just had a stress test. Yay. So um, one of the things, we, when you talk about wokeism and stuff within the Church of England, the topic is called presentism. Do we judge history by the current moral context but how we understand morals now do i judge the whole medical profession by lobotomies mm -hmm. and do or or by the, the use of leeches or do i judge them by how they operate now and uh, not judge history based on on common uh, normal context and right now the church of england is saying no if we see something bad from our past, we need to remove it. And if you're offended by something bad from the past, please contact us so we can remove it. And that's what's happening now. Yeah, this this all this started about a year or so ago when the uh, during the Black Lives Matter protests in England, where these unemployable types, um, who are basically subsidized by the government on the dole or welfare rioted about uh, statues and monuments that were uh, put up to people in the past. And in Bristol, the Dean Mandy Ford, Dean of Bristol, uh, wanted to remove uh, some stained glass windows that were given along with much of the money to help us restore the cathedral by a man several hundred years ago who was engaged in the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade. And the uh, Church of England just had this uh, critical race theory based uh, racial review uh, released last week, which we talked about recently, that all things white are bad, uh, all things black are wonderful uh, report that came out. And the Church of England has now issued a guide, guidelines and guidance to those parishes where people feel offended and unable to worship due to the presence of a plaque on the wall that commemorates what somebody did, founder of Rhodesia, uh, 
you know, or a slave owner in the West Indies or this or that or the other. So monuments to empire and monuments to slavery, those engaged in those, the Church of England is now allowing its people to remove and stick in the closet so as not to hurt or offend people to make the church a safer space. I mean, it's interesting from context, I don't want to ever be judged on the worst thing I ever did. Don't I don't want people to look back and say, you know, this is the worst thing Kevin ever did, and this is how we will forever judge him. I also don't want to be judged on the best thing I ever did. I wanted that to be something humble and not have people know about it. No big deal. You know, that's just between me and God. I do want to be judged on what Christ did for me. And, I, you know, and so I, I look back and I, I see I see the thought behind what the Church of England is trying to do here and take away offense. But that's not the Christian message. The Christian message is very offensive. How are you going to take away the gospel, the good news, mm -hmm. which is extremely mm -hmm. offensive, that you are separated from God and there's nothing you can do about it? That's it. Well, you know. the... Uh... The Bible does say something. Jesus does say something directly on point here. Yes. And that's the parable of the uh, Pharisee and the uh, tax collector. Uh, two men praying, Pharisee saying out loud, Lord, thank you that I'm not like other men. And the tax collector who is shamed in the eyes of the community puts his, uh, his robe over his head and said, Lord, forgive me a sinner. And Jesus asks, who of these two went home justified? The tax collector, the sinner, not the Pharisee. The Church of England has institutionalized Phariseeism. Um, it really reminds me of the Coca-Cola Corporation. Get, hear me out, hear me out. No, that's good. We're not going to sing, are we? <laughs> no. Do you remember in 1985, Coca-Cola changed the formula based on marketing research. Pepsi was eating their lunch. Yeah. Pepsi, Pepsi tastes sweeter. Mm -hmm. and Pepsi was doing these blind taste tests and people were, uh, and that was their ad campaign when people just tasted it, but not knowing what it was, they liked Pepsi better. So the Coca-Cola Corporation decided to change its formula after 75 years or so mm -hmm. and came out with new Coke. And it was a total marketing fiasco, total fiasco. And three months later, they brought back old Coke and called it Coca-Cola Classic. Uh, this time around, uh, the Coca-Cola Corporation is uh, the smart suits up at the smart suits up in the executive offices are saying, we need to get woke to attract people who aren't drinking Coca-Cola, because you know in New York City you have to pay exorbitant sales tax on s sodas. California, their sales tax on sodas. The left liberal elite, the coastal elites, denounce soda drinking as being something that the rubes in the interior of the country do. They don't drink Coke. And so Coca-Cola, I think in a way to reach these people, started going woke. February, they said that only 15% of their legal business would have to go to black lawyers, which is a higher percentage of lawyers than there are in blacks in the legal community, but the, never mind. Now their human resource departments are in Coca-Cola across the nation are teaching uh, people how to avoid being too white and basically uh, denigrating white people, the white culture, the white race as being uh, oppressors and inferior to black culture and race. And then they got involved in politics and got heavily involved in the Georgia Democratic Republican fight over voting laws. At Rasmussen just did a poll showing that 37% of existing Coke drinkers are not gonna drink Coke anymore because of their basically being told by the company that you're ignorant rubes, you must be Klansmen in disguise. And only 25% of those surveyed who don't drink Coke said they might try it. And the problem here is, this is what the Church of England has done. The Church of England is offending people who already go to these churches in hopes of attracting people who don't go there. So with the Coca-Cola issue, you're going to lose up to 37% of your market and you're trying to get those 25% who like your pro uh, politics but hate your product to start drinking Coke. Well, for every Billy Bob who has, or every George Conger who has 12 Diet Cokes a day, are you gonna get one Laura Conger who's a vegan who may have one Coke every six, <laughs> six months? months yeah. And she, see, she's done her job. <laughs> 
So it's it it this is what the Church of England's doing by trying to be woke. They're hoping to attract, using Pepsi's motto, a new generation, mm -hmm. while denigrating the current generation. Uh, all right. Well, I want classic Jesus. That's that's little old me. All right, so that covers uh, Justin Wokebley's uh, current crisis in Canterbury. Now, Lambeth 2020 is now Lambeth 2022. And from I get what I'm gathering off the website is Indaba was so successful in the last Lambeth, we need to fully institute, reinstitute, and have Indaba again in Lambeth 2022. The problem, George, is lambeth or indaba really did work uh in in the form they used at the last lambeth and it did destroy the anglican communion that fabric that was torn was not repairable uh gafcon surged the acna surged and uh those people who imbibed in indaba uh lost big time now i'm gonna play some semantic games okay indaba South African English is the English they speak in South Africa. Right. Um, we have American English, there's English, English, there's Indian English, Australian English. We speak the proper English here in the Conger household, uh, but uh, everybody else has an accent. But there are three uh, terms for the f word meeting that have come into South African English from the indigenous languages. We have, I wrote them down so I don't confuse them, an imbizo. And an ambizo is a gathering where people of authority, government leaders, social leaders, church leaders, come and have a consultation with people in the church. It's sort of up, down. Uh, that's a meeting. Then you have an indaba. An indaba is a bull a where people come, uh, people come and there's no expectation of a conclusion or any plan of action, just general statements. So that has people from across the social and hierarchical spectrum. And then and there's the Lekotla. A Lekotla is from the Sesotho word, which is basically a meeting of peers to hammer out a decision. And the Lambeth conferences up through 1998 were Lekotlas. They were meetings of peers that would hammer out decisions. Now, the 1998 Lambeth conference came up with some decisions that the liberal minority repudiated absolutely so in a bit of virtue signaling and pandering they came up with this indaba business now i have to say this came out of the episcopal church the episcopal church uh in its uh, i think 2006 or whatever it was general convention came up with this uh, Ubu, i think it was ubuntu whatever it was a zulu word meaning we're all going to work together and be conciliar and this and that love one another or stuff. Ubuntu, yes and the result of the episcopal church's ubuntu was jack eicher and bob duncan and keith ackerman all were kicked out of the episcopal church we had a rem rem wonderful sense of love and fellowship and consensus so the Lambeth Conference Organizing Committee decides we can virtue signal too. And so they've got, they picked this word indaba, which indaba is basically, we're going to have a non-event. We're going to have a bull session that you would have in the college dorm at two in the morning with pizza and stale beer. And we're gonna do this for two weeks rather than have Lagotha, which actually does something. And and what's going further now is that what people don't understand is that indabas work, but they work if you have an African worldview, which is that you respect the consensus of the community. What's the American worldview? I got to be me. I got to be free. I'm Frank Sinatra, baby. Uh, yeah, you know, God. if you disagree with it, I am woman, hear me roar. Mm -hmm. So the whole premise of Indaba is that everybody will agree to abide by whatever general conclusion. And in the specific cases of Lakotha, of the specific conclusions, because we have this culture that reinforces the hierarchy and authority. And you apply these pretty words to uh, a non-African setting with, power, with a Western power politics underneath that allow people to dissent without being punished or ostracized the damn thing doesn't work. 
I mean, what are they going to do 20, uh, 2032? Are they going to have uh, Lambeth powwows or, and where we smoke them peace pipe? It's that offensive. If no, you it is. It, it, no, it's it, that offensive, that pandering, yeah. to use the phrase in Daba and have it be fake. Uh, it's like saying Taco Bell is Mexican food. You know, it's just that fake. Well, no, and this is the, we're getting some wisdom out of this is extraordinarily racist. This is the equivalent to hiding the microphones again from the African continent. Um, mm -hmm. Remember, uh, I don't know, two Lambus ago, uh, you said, yeah, you're welcome to speak. You show up, there's no microphone. Uh, there mm -hmm. was no voice from the African mm -hmm. church because the Western influence, the Americans and the uh, English and the Europeans did not want African influence in the Anglican communion. They hid the microphones. In Daba, 88. 88, 88, 1988. And so in Daba is the same thing. It's the equivalent of hiding the microphones. We're all going to get together. And in Daba to the Americans, it's just the listening process. All we're doing is enabling the listening process. And we're going to listen and listen and listen. And Indaba allows you to talk and talk and talk without a conclusion. And where how this works is that there's something called the Delphi process. And the Delphi process was categorized by the Rand Corporation in the 1960s. The Delphi process is that you can control the outcome of debates and discussion by the by laying down the tracks of the discussion. So in the Delphi process, you break apart in a small, if you have a contentious issue, you break apart into small groups, you appoint someone to facilitate and to take notes. Then you invite everybody to speak so that they're basically talked out. Then the facilitator writes down the important points that they think are important and presents it to the larger group. So what does that mean? Whoever the facilitators are drive the outcome because they will select what they think to be best. And what we saw in Lambeth 2008, the facilitators were almost all Western bishops. Well, the issue was, well, they know computers better. Some even know shorthand. They're familiar with parliamentary procedure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Outcome still was a false representation of what the majority felt and believed. So if you had a gathering of 40 bishops and 35 were conservative and five were liberal, and you had a liberal facilitator, you would basically have equal time in both, and then the facilitator would shade it with the liberal conclusion. And that's how Lambeth, uh, the last one that you and I went to, Kevin, and but basically we're looking at the documents they're going down the same road again. I remember talking, I don't know if the bishop was Congolese or Uganda, uh, one of the bishops I had met at the last Lambeth, and we talked a little bit about Indaba. He says Indaba only works because no women are allowed. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, that's the rules of Indaba. No women are allowed. I said, okay, man, maybe that, well, let's see what happens. So um, I, I'm assuming they're not going to uh, put it in the full African context once again and do it the Western way, George. Oh, well. Well, so, but the thing is, it's, it's just, it, shows how craven the administrators are at the Anglican Communion Office and at Lambeth Palace, mm -hmm. that they'll use these flowery foreign phrases and have all this word salad gobbledygook about what our hopes and aspirations, we want everybody to be heard, when they're basically writing now the conclusions of what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you had the old way, which in, in an, a Western European way was a Roberts Rules of Order majority rules, which was the same as the uh, Lekotha, the uh, African gathering of chiefs to come to a conclusion. You could come, you know, everybody, that worked. But that's not what the leaders want these days. They want, they want inertia. They don't want things to come to a conclusion because that will cause the Americans to walk off in a huff. And huff they do. All right. Last story of the day. There is a new Archbishop of Sydney. Um, I just did an interview with um, David Old before we published our last show, so we didn't talk about it. But uh, it seems that he's going to get a, uh, a a good voice at the table. He's very popular, and I thought we could talk a little bit about. Now, I'm not good at Indian names, so. 
please forgive me, Kanishka Rafael. Kanishka? That's good enough. Okay. Uh, is the new Archbishop of Sydney. Um, what say you, George? Well, he's a remarkable fellow. I did not know this till I read the uh, the background papers put out by uh, Russell Powell at uh, Sydney Anglican Media Sydney, or Sydney Anglicans, excuse me. Right. Uh, Kanishka Rafael was born in London. He's of Sri Lankan or Selenese ancestry, and his family moved to Canada when he was seven and then to Australia. When he was 21 in college, he was introduced to Christianity and the Gospel of John, and that brought him to a say He's an adult convert to Christianity. And he is, uh, he was out in uh, serving the church in Western Australia before I think he was called to, he was in Perth before he was called to be the Dean of St. Andrews in Sydney. And he's been there since 2015, 2016, and he's now been elected Bishop. And he is a, he's a, it finally came down to the choice between a charismatic, uh, fiery believer or a very, very good administrator the two finalists and they Sydney opted for the charismatic uh Christian I mean this guy is real this okay. guy believes that he's not one of the drones that we see in the house of bishops in the Episcopal Church or the non-entities we see in other uh, Anglican churches in the United States okay. this guy is the real stuff he's That's on good. fire all right and so. he's done a good job administratively in the past He's going to walk in immediately to the highest echelons of the Anglican world. Um, and he's relatively young. He's our age, maybe a year or two older or younger, or maybe he's in between Kevin and me. So he takes uh, a motor so every be couple there for hours. A <laughs> so he, well, his hair has gone gray. You've lost your hair. I'm still blonde. So uh, maybe I don't know where that puts it. But uh, this is a, now he's he's probably the right man for the right time in sydney because australia is going through a really hard secular time right now mm. really pushing that and um, a justin welby type go along get along not to offend everybody is just the worst sort of person to have in that situation instead you have somebody who's an unapologetic unapologetic believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ and is willing to explain why and to take the consequences. So I believe this is a plus plus um, for Sydney, for the Anglican world, the Anglican witness in the world. Which is good because if you haven't been paying attention, things in the secular world are not getting any better. Russia just recently hacked our uh, pipeline here. Uh, and shut down the Northeast, and we have gas lines for the first time since 1973. Yay! Be really cool if somebody showed up in their Ford Pinto. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, Israel is being bombarded by rockets from the Hamas, which is no, look, Lutherans. It's being bombarded by Lutherans. If <laughs> I thought that's what we talked about, you know. Oh man, it just. You go through some of these news stories, and it's just like, yeah, it's, it's you thought that 2021 would be better than 2020, and uh, so far we're five months in. Yeah, not sold. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 661 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm gonna go with 662. That one too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>